Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you so much to Julie for being here. Um, just so everyone kind of knows the order of the night, we are going to hear Julie's presentation and then we are going to go downstairs, have uh, officially start Shabbat with candle lighting, Kiddush and Motzi and then have a potluck together. Um, we are kind of threading the line in that we're kind of in Shabbos mode, but we also wanted to use a screen and presentation and Shabbos doesn't start for another hour. So we're going to play up the spring and summeriness of it all. Um, although I would still really appreciate it if folks kept their phones put away. And certainly if you want to take a minute to make sure they're on silent, um, would really appreciate that. Um, I also just want to make sure that I thank uh, CJP, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, for the generous grant that allowed us to bring Julie here. We're really, really appreciative to them. Um, yeah, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm not going to give a long intro because this session is Julie's story, so me giving an intro before she tells us in her own words about herself seems silly. Um, the two things that I will say by way of introduction is just first of all, um, I met Julie in August when she was on her way back down from a gig in Maine. Um, and like, as soon as you walked in the shul, it felt like you were a good fit to come speak to this community, which is really reassuring. And that feels extra important to recognize just because the work that you do as a soferet and a scribe isn't usually done by people whose Jewish values always align with our Jewish values. And so the importance of you doing the work that you do and opening up that world and expanding that world and modeling for others that parts of Jewish practice and tradition that have traditionally been closed off to at least the 50% non-male part of the population, if not much more of the population than that, is really, really important and a really wonderful message for our community and for the whole Jewish world. Um, the other reason that I'm really excited for this session in particular, just for Julie to tell her story, is last night um, when she got here, Julie and I scrolled through all of the or six of the seven scrolls that CAA knows uh, that CAA owns. As far as I know, maybe one of you has more history. We don't know anything about any of them, which feels like such a loss of information, history, tradition. Um, and so Julie's going to be working on at least one of our scrolls. And so to be able to actually associate that work with a moment in time and a person and to hear her story and how she came to do this work and what it means to her um, feels really, really special. And I hope, listen, we can't go back in time and find out more about the history and provenance of these Torah scrolls, but at least kind of from this point forward, we can have a little bit more history and provenance and story and context. So I'm really appreciative to be able to tie your story into that. And I'm hoping that's kind of a process that we start as a community this evening. So with no further ado, um, it is my pleasure and honor to call Julie Seltzer up to uh, present an ink of her ink of her own. Can y'all hear me? Great. Um, thank you, Rabbi Alex, for that really lovely introduction and for really making this all happen from start to finish. I mean, we haven't finished yet. We've barely started, but um, for really, for, for making this happen. Um, it's so great to be here. Thank you everyone for being here tonight and for the warm welcome. I'm very much looking forward to spending the weekend together and learning and talking Torah. So, so um, we thought that as an introduction to the weekend, I would share my personal story. I do not usually spend 40 minutes talking about my personal story, but I hope you'll find it interesting. And I hope uh, at the end, you might have some questions. Um, so before I launch into that, I, I'll just share a word about this week's Torah portion, um, Tezria, which is basically the most awkward, um, you know, Torah portion, the one that the other uh, B'nai Mitzvah students definitely don't want. Um, it's all about skin eruptions and emissions of various colors and qualities. And what makes something tamay, um, often translated as impure, 
and what must be done to make it tahor, often translated as pure. So these states of tameh and tahor not only apply to a person, but to materials like wool, linen, these are transferable. And as a scribe and as someone who regularly, regularly has close access to Torah scrolls, um, I feel like I run into this idea or this notion, this, this, this like fear of getting close because maybe we're not pure. We're not like, like the, the Torah scroll is like holy and we might ruin it or we might you know, do something to it or transfer something bad onto it. And um, I, I, I know that there's an, there's an underlying fear of handling the scroll and I, I sense a mental association of ourselves with impurity and the scroll with purity. But it's actually in some ways the other way around. Um, the Mishnah tells us that Sifre Kodesh Mitam Imetayadaim, that holy books can make the hands unclean. Now there are historical reasons for this having to do with um, mice, dead mice, um, and what was stored with the scrolls. But uh, as we enter Shabbat Tazriah with this opportunity to get a little closer to Torah, I, I offer an invitation to, um, to think about it a little differently, to think that, now, now of course we do avoid touching the scrolls unnecessarily, especially where the letters are because it will have an impact over time and we want to, the scroll to stay in best shape as possible. But I think psychologically this has been taken to the extreme. And I'm gonna pull the curtain back a little, if you will, you know, expose the wizard and invite you to get a little closer to the, the Torah scrolls and to the, uh, to the craft of the scribe who creates them. So this weekend, I, I am actually observing my mother's 16th yurt site. Um, so I would like to share this presentation in her memory. Um, you'll also see as I share my story that her illness and death played a pivotal role in me becoming a scribe. So it's particularly apt um, that I'm talking about this this weekend. Not only that, but it is the 13th uh, anniversary of finishing my first Torah scroll. Um, also, that fit also fell on Tezria. <laughs> so, so the, hey, this is a great Torah portion. I love it. Um, so I wrote that first Torah scroll at the, uh, as part of an exhibit at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, and I'll, I'll talk about that briefly tonight. Um, so, oh, uh, also I'll just say something about this picture. Um, this is me repairing a Torah scroll. I liked this photo both because of the verse that I'm working on. Can anyone tell what Tzedek, Tzedek, Tir Dov. Great. Um, justice, justice, you will pursue. So it's a, you know, a, a famous line from the Torah. Also, I have, I happen to, I don't actually usually wear nail polish, but back when I was doing this, I happened to have sparkly blue, purple nail polish on, and I just thought, oh, that's a, that's a fun picture. Okay, um, so next slide, please. Um, so where, how did I get from here? This is me, my bat mitzvah. Uh, to here, this is me writing my first Torah scroll at the Contemporary Jewish uh, Museum. Um, so some people know from a very early age what they want to do professionally, um, and their stories have this almost mystical sense of purpose and clarity. Uh, this is not one of those stories. <laughs> I wanted to be a veterinarian um, until I found out that you have to give animals shots. And then I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast until I wasn't good enough to get to the Olympics. Um, and, and I would say that growing up, I knew what a Torah scroll was. Um, I had a, had a bat mitzvah. I, I chanted from the, from the Torah, from the Torah scroll. Um, and perhaps on some level, I, I even knew that it was handwritten. But becoming a scribe, let alone knowing that scribes existed or what they did, was, was not something I gave any thought to. Um, not until a kind of light bulb moment of inspiration in my early 30s, which I will circle back to after I go through a little bit of background. Um, so in a somewhat random decision, um, my, my parents sent me to a Jewish elementary school. I did grow up Jewish, but, but you know, of families that send their kids to Jewish day schools, mine would, doesn't really, didn't really fall into like that particular category. Um, 
And, but, I, but I was privileged to be exposed to Hebrew at a very early age. And when I went back to learn it as a young adult, I felt that it was lodged in my brain, um, perhaps lodged in my soul even. That's how I connected, I've always felt to Hebrew and the Hebrew language, almost as if it was my mother tongue that I couldn't really speak yet. Um, but I would like to point out that not every aspect of Hebrew came easily, apparently, and uh, I actually just recently found my, uh, my report card from one of these years, and I did very well in school. I had straight A's in all subjects, but one. Handwriting, yes. What can I say? I never claimed to be a natural. I, I did when, I, I mean, it, this is very, I found it like last year or something. I was like, I wish I knew who that teacher was. And I say, you'll never believe what I'm doing now. Um, but I did, uh, I did always love synagogue and the ritual space um, in addition to the ancient language and, and the singing and, and especially the cookies at Kiddush. But like many others, I quit Hebrew school and synagogue right after my bat mitzvah. So how did I go from Hebrew school dropout who was bad at handwriting, to Torah scribe, and more importantly, why? So I will start the adult part of the story at age 18, um, when I was accepted to my top choice college with a caveat, I could only start in the second semester. So what was I to do with these free six months? And my bubby, my mother's mother, suggested that I go to Israel and volunteer on a kibbutz and that she would buy a plane ticket for me. Um, bubby was the only one in my family who had ever been to Israel. She was there on a 10 day trip in 1982. Um, I said, great, Israel sounds amazing, mainly because it was far, far away from Yardley, Pennsylvania, the suburb uh, in which I grew up. I'd never been out of the country, save for a glee club trip to Toronto, and the idea of traveling abroad was very exciting. It did not matter to me one bit whether it was France or Israel or Peru, as long as it was elsewhere. So off I went to volunteer on a kibbutz. Uh, I have a picture of the kibbutz. Actually, I don't know if this is actually the kibbutz that I was on. I was, I was in the north, um, but I volunteered and started relearning Hebrew. I started in Aleph Plus, like Aleph Plus, you know, you know the alphabet, but not much more. Um, and it, is, it was there that I fell back in love with Hebrew. Um, and over the next couple of decades, I became pretty fluent in modern Hebrew, which, um, which helps me now place orders to the scribal supply shop in, in Jerusalem. So in my mid-20s, after college, and after dabbling in some Jewish studies classes, um, both in college and in adult ed, I applied to spend three weeks at Pardes, uh, a yeshiva in Jerusalem. And three weeks ended up turning into a year. During that time, there was a man named uh, Dov Lehman, who would later be one of my teachers, who offered a class on the scribal arts. It was an optional like evening class. I was not called to it in the least. I didn't even think about taking it. Um, and I tell you this mostly to challenge the idea that we're meant to do one thing our entire lives at, from an early age and that this interest remains strong and unchanging throughout our lives. For some people, this might be true, but there are many ways um, to devote ourselves to a, ourselves to a practice and, and different moments that we're drawn to certain things and not others for one reason or another, and sometimes we don't totally understand those reasons. Um, so though I did not learn scribal arts at this time, Pardes did give me the tools to study ancient Jewish texts, including the Mishnah, Halacha, and Talmud. So a few years later, I was living and working in New York City, and I attended a weekend workshop upstate with a Jewish theater group I was, uh, I was working with called Storytelling. Um, that, that's what I ended up studying in college, I studied theater. 
and it was held at a place called Eilat Chaim. Does anyone ever heard? You raise your hand if you've heard of Eilat Chaim. Okay, so a few people here, great. So, so this was the summer that Eilat Chaim cl was closing its doors, and it was merging with Isabella Friedman, which I assumed more people would probably heard of. Raise your hand if you've heard of Is Isabella Friedman. So a few more people. So two retreat centers, two Jewish retreat centers, Eilat Chaim was closing and merging. And as part of this move, they organized a Torah walk um, in which they walked, or well, I ended up participating. So we walked and transported this Torah scroll by foot 50 miles from Ulster County, New York to Falls Village, Connecticut. And we were divided you know, into groups. I think, oh, whoops, I missed that slide. That's part ace. <laughs> Sorry, I forget which pictures I have. Okay, so here, <clears throat> here is sort of the end of the, the walk. And we were in small groups and each person carried the Torah scroll in a, on a backpack for one mile. This is after we took it out of the backpack because this is at the very end. So it was wrapped in, you know, a, a belt and a mantle like most Torah scrolls, but but this one was in, like I said, this this beautifully decorated hiking pack, hiking back pack, um, which was purple and sparkly and gold. And uh, despite contemporary accoutrements like a bungee cord, it you know, mimicked the temporary Ark of the Hebrews as they carried the tablets through the wilderness. So we, um, we sang ancient Hebrew songs and carried the ancient words of Torah written by hand with a feather on pieces of animal parchment on our backs. And as we skipped along, and as I carried this precious Torah scroll, an object that represents our shared history and culture and religion, I felt part of a chain of history not only part of that immediate community, but part of something larger, a larger community that transcends time and space. So with some fear and hesitation, I quit my New York City desk job in order to volunteer for three months as a housekeeper at Isabella Friedman. This is, this is me comparing sort of the joy of having an office job to the joy of dancing with the Torah scroll in the middle of nature. So you can understand. <laughs> so, so this actually turned out to be not only good for my soul, but an excellent career move uh, in ways I could not have anticipate, anticipated. Um, because being there opened up just a whole new world to me um, and a lot of spare time. I, I was a uh, I was meant to be there for three months, but it turned into a job as sous chef and then baker. So one day in, by the way, I used to, I got a little bored of just making braided challah. So I started making challah in the shapes of things from the weekly Torah portion. And it got, it got very out of control very fast. Like, <laughs> like large scenes of, you know, yeah. And like 10 people working on it. And it was very fun. Um, so one day in early April, soon after I was hired as sous chef, I got a call. Let's see, what's the next slide? I got a call on the kitchen line. I think this may, um, from my dad. And he told me, he said, remember that cough your mother had at Thanksgiving? He was, was calling to tell me that she probably had lung cancer. Um, they were waiting for the biopsy, but it did not look good. And she did, and we were told she had a year to live, which was about accurate. And, um, and I was very grateful that I had recently decided to stay at the retreat center because I felt very held by the community there. Um, and I turned inward a bit. I wanted to kind of simplify my life um, as I was splitting time between Connecticut and Yardley to be with my mom and help take her to doctor's appointments. Um, and at the same time, my spiritual connection with Jewish practices and learning was also growing. And I had the opportunity to sit in on classes and events at the retreat center. So sometime later, it was uh, in December. So about eight months into eight months after my mother's diagnosis, I was on a, a short trip to Israel. I was there for like 10 days with a friend. Um, and I was walking down the street and this is this was the light bulb moment all of a sudden i just the thought popped in my head huh i want to learn how to write the letters the way they're written in the torah scroll and it just was it just it it, it like came from nowhere i i or it felt like it came from nowhere because i have no 
artistic background, no calligraphy background, never been much interested in that. Um, but I think, you know, looking back on it, and I didn't, I wouldn't have said this necessarily at the time, but looking back on it, I realized that, that the practice demands a turning in, a, a focus that would be kind of a respite from the, the chaos that was unfolding around me, my mother's illness, and it, it gave me something tangible to focus on. And Torah has something eternal about it, right? In the face of mortality, I could dip my toe in the forever. The Midrash, oh, this is, this is Isabella Friedman. Isn't it beautiful? These are the Canada geese, and um, I, I, I cut some of my first feathers from them. Um, but the Midrash tells us that God looked into the Torah and created the world. So the Torah in this philosophical framework existed before anything else and is the blueprint for everything that came after. The letters themselves are seen as building blocks for creation. Um, and, and this is the next slide, please. Um, it, this is based actually on, on a, an interpretation of the first word of Genesis. It's the first verse of Genesis. So this is the very first line of the Torah. Bereshit bara Elohim et shemaim It means God created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, there's this word in red, et. Um, et doesn't mean anything. It's a grammatical word. It comes um, before a direct object in a sentence. So we don't really, we don't have an equivalent in English, but other languages have you know, something similar. But what did the rabbis do when they interpreted this? They said, bereshit bara Elohim, et. In the beginning, God created et. What is et? Et is everything from Aleph to Taf. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet to the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In the beginning, God created the alphabet. And then through the alphabet, everything came into being. So even, you know, even on a more human scale, the words of Torah have been passed down for thousands of years and will hopefully get passed down for thousands of more. The role of the scribe is to help with that transmission. And the scrolls themselves outlive us. I regularly see Torah scrolls that are 100, 200, 250 years old. Ultimately, Torah scrolls also have a lifespan. And when they're no longer fit for use and cannot be repaired, they are buried, just as we are. Over time, the ink fades into oblivion or starts to crack and chip, and it doesn't make sense to re-ink letters on aging parchment. But Torah, not the scroll, but the text of Torah and Torah more broadly, including the oral tradition and our comments and discussions and our conversation this evening, that is eternal. So when I returned home to the retreat center from that trip to Israel after having this idea uh, for a, a new hobby. I, you know, it was going to be, if it was going to be anything, it was going to be a hobby. I mean, I certainly did not think it was going to be a career. Uh, I went to the art store and I bought a calligraphy pen. Um, has anyone here done calligraphy ever? Okay, a few people. So you will maybe especially appreci appreciate um, what happened at this point. I had never tried calligraphy before. So I get home and there's this plastic pen shaped thing and a bunch of metal nibs. And I, there's, there's a slit in the, in the plastic thing where you stick the nib and it like holds there. But I didn't know that there was this little slit. So I was holding the nib kind of with my thumb and my finger at the end of the pen. I'm like, it kept slipping. And I'm like, how does this Thing work. I can't do it. I can't do it. So it took me like three hours to figure that out. Um, but that was just a just a hint of the the challenges that were to that were to come with cutting quills, um, which you know I was I mentioned I was cutting from those Canada geese feathers. Um, so I then found a website that demonst demonstrated how to form the letters in Torah script. And I started practicing those Hebrew letters to the best of my ability. Um, I, again, I needed a distraction more than I needed a career or a calling. But I made rows and rows of bets and rows and rows of dalids. And on my trips home, I would show my mother some of my practice sheets. 
few months into practicing, maybe, maybe two months, I realized that if I wanted to improve, I would need to find a teacher. Someone who could show me not only how to cut a quill, but how to form a tzadi, which seemed to me an impossible feat, um, and to introduce me to the halakha, the rules for um, the scribal writing. If I wanted to shift this hobby into something more, and I, I, I don't know that it crossed my mind at this point, um, but uh, I, needed to, I needed to start learning the laws, you know, if I wanted it to get anything, if I wanted it to become anything more. So it was when I was started to look for a teacher, that's when I realized that there basically were not women doing this. I had no idea before. When I was growing up, already women were becoming rabbis. Um, and by the time I was learning calligraphy, probably half of all the rabbinical students were, were women, or at least, you know, in the, of course, you know, in the, the non-Orthodox um, denominations. And while there, of course, is still work to be done, and there's always work to be done in this arena, I, you know, I just, it didn't occur to me that, um, that there weren't really women scribes. But I started looking around for names of people to teach me, and I was getting the same, like, two or three names within a, a three-hour radius. And I realized that's because they were the only people around that, that, that knew it and were willing to teach a woman. Um, one of the names was Jen Taylor Friedman, um, and she ended up being one of my primary teachers. She was, she was mainly self-taught, um, and she became the first woman that we know of to write a kosher Torah scroll. Um, and she finished that scroll in 2007, the same year I contacted her asking to learn. Um, I would soon become, much to my surprise, the second woman that we know of to write a kosher Torah scroll when I completed my first one in 2011. So um, this, by the way, is a picture of uh, the Women's Torah Project. It's around the time I was looking for a teacher, I also heard of something called the Women's Torah Project, which brought together multiple women to each write a section of a Torah scroll. I ended up working on this project as well. Um, that was, that's for a congregation in, uh, in Seattle. So I, and I contact, but I contacted Jen um, in this moment and I, um, and she was giving kind of group lessons, small group lessons. There weren't like thousands of people wanting to learn this, but there were like two or three people. And um, I showed up to one lesson in March of 2008 and then I disappeared. So I assume she probably thought I was, you know, just one more hobbyist that, you know, tries it out, gives it up. But it's that my mom had died um, just one week after that first meeting. So right after Shloshim, the 30 days after her, after her death, um, I met Jen again. And we started meeting weekly. By the way, when I asked her permission to use the photo, she said, I hope you tell them the, she's, she's British, I hope you tell them the bit about how you were so terrified when you walked in to learn. <laughs> and, okay, I'll tell. I was so terrified, or at least I looked so terrified. I was very intimidated, I'll put it that way. Um, so at one of those first meetings, we read the first section of Keset HaSofer, the main halachic compendium for Ashkenazi stri scribal tradition. And um, it's based on the Talmud, a section from the Talmud, um, which we don't, I just thought if, if you, you know, if you're a visual person, you might want to read through it. But, but basically people ask, so why, why have women been excluded from this tradition? And it goes back to an interpretation from the rabbis based on who's obligated to lay tefillin. And in their mind, men, only were obligated to wear tefillin. And they said, okay, since there's a verse about tefillin and, uh, um, and the verse about tefillin is right next to the verse about mezuzah, so only the people who are obligated to lay tefillin write tefillin. And therefore, since it's next to the verse about mezuzah, only the people who write tefillin, tefillin are also the people that write mezuzot. So that's only men. And now we have a category of, of people who write and people who are, you know, who write kosher Jewish sacred texts. And we're expanding that out also to include um, Sefer Torah, a uh, Torah scroll. So of course they could have started it the other direction. If they started with the mezuzah, they could have said, everyone's obligated in mezuzah. So therefore anyone and everyone can write mezuzah. And therefore, since the verse about mezuzah is right next to the verse about tefillin, 
everyone can also write tefillin. But of course, they didn't go in that direction because as I see it, you know, they didn't, they start with their, their worldview and, and through that worldview interpret the text. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's a problematic text in, for our contemporary sensibilities of inclusion. Um, but since I view halacha as being inextricably connected to history and culture, not divinely ordained, this did not come as a particular surprise. Um, so let's see. So, so I was not I was not particularly deterred. <laughs> I also pushed in seventh grade to be on the boys football team. They were like, lacrosse is the girls. I was like, lacrosse? I don't even know what that is. I don't know how to play. Um, so I, I a little bit have a history of, you know, maybe doing this kind of thing. But so a few, uh, a few months after learning weekly with Jen, I went back to Israel and um, I planned three weeks of intensive study. I connected with, next slide, please. Uh, double, double hit. Yeah, thank you. Um, with Shoshana Guggenheim, he's here on the left. She was the lead scribe in the Women's Tour Project. And I reconnected here with Dove Lehman at the bottom right, the, the one who taught at Pardes. And, um, and up above, this is just to show you, who, has anyone seen this giant mezuzah in the airport in Israel? Okay, so it's, it's very large. It's like, I think like the, probably the biggest one in the world. Um, so I, I suddenly was kind of noticing Mizuzot more than I had before. I probably before, I mean, I would maybe notice, but I never thought about what was inside. Um, and what's inside are the first two paragraphs of the Shema prayer written in what's called Ashurit script on animal parchment, according to very specific laws by a trained scribe and usually in very tiny letters. Um, and I started to think, could I maybe be one of those scribes? So Shoshana, oh, not yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want to say one more thing, almost. Um, I just want to say one more thing about Shoshana. I don't know if you can tell, she's writing on this special desk, and there's like a slit in the middle, and you can kind of push the parchment through, and I would not yet appreciate how amazing this type of desk was. And I asked her if she would teach me how to cut a quill. And she told me that, quite honestly, her skills were not good enough to teach me. Um, with cutting a quill, because cutting quill is really like the hardest skill, I thought, of all the, of all the skills. Um, so she sent me to, to Dove, and that's how I ended up um, meeting, meeting with, uh, with Dove almost every day for two weeks. And by the end, he encouraged me to work towards a goal. Um, he told me to, uh, that, that I would likely be ready in six months to write a short Megillah. Now, when we say Megillah, we usually think of Esther, the Megillah that we read on Purim, that's actually Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, but we call it just the Megillah for short, but there are other Megillot that we read on the other holidays. So for example, on Passover coming up, we'll read Shira Shirim, and they don't have to be written. The, the Megillah, the, the Esther Megillah is the only one that has to be written on parchment in a special manner, but the other ones can be, and they're good for practicing, and also they're sh shorter. Well, mo many of them are shorter. So I wanted to write Echa, Lamentations, read on Tisha B'Av, uh, probably because, you know, I was in a sort of depressed uh, kind of state of mind. But um, Dove encouraged me to focus on love. And um, I recall him saying, Julie, you're young, you're single, you should write about love, not destruction. <laughs> For the record, I'm now old and still single. <laughs> but I did take his advice and I, uh, and I went to get parchment for Shir Shirim, Song of Songs. Um, and a short story about, oh, do I have time to tell the story? Yes, I have time. Okay. So, and also it's a pretty good story. So, um, so Dove sent, sent me to a particular store. Um, I might retell this story on Sunday if you'll be here. But um, so not all the stores will sell to women. And he knew who would be kind of friend friendly. Um, and so I went to this store in the northern section of like an ultra Orthodox neighborhood of Jerusalem that I'd never been to called Sanhedria. And I, you know, I'm dressed like toe to, you know, wrist covered and, but I still completely stood out, you know, and, and I find the little hut 
and I walk in and, you know, it's all, you know, men with payas and, you know, and white shirts and black pants and, and I like very <laughs> nervously like walk up to the desk and I'm like, are you Meir? And, and he was very nice. And, um, and I think I actually have a picture. Kyo had two slides, three slides, four slides. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. So I'll just, just for the sake of a visual. So this is, this is Meir, um, this is the shop. You can see all the parchment in the back. Um, and the, the story, and so, so he was very nice, but I never said, oh, I'm going to write it. You know, it was just sort of a, basically like a don't ask, don't tell policy, if you all remember from the Clinton administration about um, gays in the military. This was like the approach, don't ask, don't tell. So eventually, when I got into the um, uh, women's Torah project, there were three of us who were writing for that Torah scroll that were all living in Jerusalem at the time. So we went to buy the parchment together and we picked it all out. We spent the entire day at the store. And at the end, and, and it's a family-run business, and they were, you know, bringing us tea and everything. And so at the end of the day, Meir says, so, who's writing this Torah? And we were like, you know, moment of truth. <laughs> like, because, we, you know, they, we thought maybe he probably, he might have thought we were buying the parchment for our brother or father or someone else. So I think, I don't know, one of us said, um, we are we are <laughs> you know as if like what would you say if we told you we're the ones and without like even a hesitation he said in, in hebrew uh, oh for a reform synagogue <laughs> we're like well it's actually reconstructionist but you know basically yes yes so he you know he got it so it's it feels like this cultural exchange almost but um we're still very much in touch um i still get my parchment from from him. Okay, can we go back like three slides? Thank you. Now you all have it. Okay, yeah, great. So I was learning and learning and learning. Um, I'm a righty. People often ask, well, is it hard, easier for lefties because you don't, you, you know, you, when you're writing in Hebrew, like you don't, like it's wet and like it's just, so yes, I, I, I did once land my whole arm in a verse that I had written and and so this is like the inverse, like the imprint of a line of Torah in my arm. And amazingly, it was fine. It was just like the, the like surface level of the ink that came up on my arm. Um, and here are the letters. So, um, so after I, after I uh, learned a bunch with Jen um, and I returned from Israel, I ended up getting a uh, an apprenticeship with a scribe in Westchester, Neil Yerman, if anyone has heard that name. And I was there for about six months. And no, longer, yeah, yes, uh, nine months maybe. And that spring, a year, about a year and a few months, a year, a year, year and a half after starting to learn, an interesting thing happened. So Jen, my teacher, was about to start another Torah scroll. And before beginning to write, it's traditional for scribes to go to the mikvah, ritual uh, immersion. And I had gathered a yortzite minion for my mother. It was the, her first yortzite. And right after um, Ma'ariv and Kaddish, Jen left to go directly from the minion to the mikvah and then to immediately start her Torah scroll. And this is just a very beautiful kind of like passing down of the tradition um, mother to child and teacher to student and generation to generation. And a couple days later, Jen calls and tells me that she had received a phone call from a museum in San Francisco looking for a woman to sit on display and write a Torah scroll as part of an exhibit. And Jen said, um, they want someone to write a Torah in a museum and I think it should be you. And I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, so anyway, yeah, that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> I was I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time because there just weren't that many of us to choose from. There were maybe like three of us to choose from, and it was you know three months before they wanted to start, and um, and I was probably the only one that could you know pick up and move. Um, and I just I feel like I have all the gen like the generation all the women from the generation of feminists before me to thank for creating environment in which women could do things that were not previously uh, open to them and i'm also particularly grateful to communities like this one who are not just like accepting of but um, actively interested in the work of women scribes and and um, non-orthodox scribes of all genders 
So I spent the next 18 months working on a Torah scroll um, in part on display as people watched. And I held twice daily Q&A sessions with people from all backgrounds from all over the world for 18 months. So whatever question you may have but are too shy to ask, don't worry, I have heard it all. Um, and, oh, okay, next, next slide, please. I'll, I'm gonna share one more personal part to this story. Um, so several months into writing that first Torah scroll at the museum, um, my dad called and told me they'd found something um, when they were going through my family's belongings. It was a charcoal drawing, an art, a piece of art that, that um, my uncle Robert had drawn. So my uncle Robert was my mother's brother and he died of cancer at a very young age, he was 28. And I was just five when he died, but I remember feeling very connected to him, um, even at that young age. And when he was sick uh, and he had like nights of insomnia, he made a few charcoals. And I remember one of the charcoals, it was a, like a man playing the banjo. It was it hung on the wall of my Bubby and Zadie's house. Um, but the charcoal that my dad found, which had been stored in a basement this whole time, was of a scribe writing a Torah. And that is it. And so now it's, this is actually my old, my old apartment, um, so it's not up to date, but this is the only picture, I, but it's still in my new, in my house, I still have it there, it is hanging on my wall right above my, my writing desk, so. Um, so, in conclusion, oh, one more. Oh, okay, actually, okay, before, I, before the conclusion, I'll go back to my ear for one moment, um, if, if you don't mind. So, so this is me um, during, during the, the pandemic, um, sometime during the pandemic. This is not at the parchment store in Jerusalem. This is actually at the only other place in this country that makes parchment, not kosher parchment necessarily, but parchment nonetheless. Um, kosher parchment has to do with, you actually have to make it with the explicit intention for sacred use. So that's one of the differences. But it's uh, it's like half hour from my house randomly. It's called Pergamina, and so a colleague was is trying to work with them to make you know to help to maybe start some kosher parchment making. So I was I was checking out some parchment. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So in conclusion, um, we remain a small sorority of women in this line of work, though we are growing, um, and knowledge about us is growing too. So. Um, uh, and I think most people are happy about it, certainly like the ones that that want to invite us. Um, others maybe are are not as thrilled, but it doesn't necessarily fit the stereotypes as as that you might assume. Um, and uh, this is our this is our a kind of loosely affiliated group. We're called Stam Scribes. Stam is the acronym for what scribes are trained to write. So Sefer Torah, Tefillin, Mezuzah, and Megillah. Um, and we share best practices and we network and we share resources and contacts and uh, kind of like a family. So I feel very blessed to be um, living at this, at this moment in time. Um, so that concludes my story. And I know that, uh, so it's 10 minutes before seven. I know Shabbat is coming. So we will definitely wanna be closing down the, the projector, um, but I will be happy to take questions now and whatever we can't get to now, we can continue chatting over Kiddush and dinner. I want to say that concludes your story to this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, we can do like 10 minutes of questions. Great. If, there, um, if, if, if folks yeah. have questions, I, I'm going to carry around the mic if anyone has questions. And the good Reminder is this is the beginning of Julie's time with us. This is not your only opportunity to ask a question. So Julie, um, at this point in time, is there a college, you know, course or a certificate or a degree that people can um, become Torah scribes? Okay, so the question is, is there a college certificate or degree that people can become Torah scribes? So no. Um, it is all, it's, it's very sort of traditional learning, like apprenticeship. Um, there is a school in Jerusalem, it's not college, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I guess a trade, you know, a, like a trade. Um, and I don't know how long it takes to get certified, but maybe six months or something like that. 
that's only for men, um, possibly only for Orthodox men. So, so women, you know, we, we have to do sort of a different way of learning, you know, private learning, apprenticeship, but that's also quite traditional. So not, not all the male scribes go to that school. They also often apprentice and learn from, from a teacher. Yeah. How was it that, that um, whatever it was in San Francisco wanted a woman scribe to be on display? Okay, so why, so, oh, do I have to repeat the question given that no. it's on the microphone? Okay, because <laughs> we had talked about it, okay. <laughs> um, so, so the museum in San Francisco, it's called the Contemporary Jewish Museum. And the, um, the person who was the head of the artistic director of the museum at that time, um, Connie Wolf, had this idea in conjunction with someone who, I can't remember who, like maybe the chancellor at JTS or some, someone connected with JTS. They had this idea of doing an exhibit about Torah and having a scribe write, write it in the museum, sort of live performance art. Um, but Connie was thinking, you know, this is a contemporary Jewish museum. So what's going to be our contemporary spin on something ancient, you know, like what is contemporary about a Torah scroll? Nothing much, unless we have a woman write it. So that was why they wanted um, a woman in particular. Julie, can I put you on the spot for one of thing? Course, yes. If you're talking about contemporary, are you gonna talk about your Megillah at any point? Oh, I wasn't. But Can you just mention sure. it and what's special about it? <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I wrote, um, I just finished for this Purim, a Megillah. So the, the, there's a traditional layout for a Megillah, which has the word Hamelech at the top of each column. The word Hamelech means the king. So, you know, Hamelech HaChashverosh, you know, is mentioned a lot and enough times to, you know, to start every column. So there are multiple um, layouts that have Hamelech at the top of, not every column, because some columns can't, um, I won't get into those, but, well, the first column can't, of course, but, um, but also the Sons of Haman and, and the, after the Sons of Haman. So anyway, um, there's a 21 line version, a 28 line version, various versions. And I, I made one this year. So this idea, I can't remember whose idea, I think actually the person whose idea this originally was, was Rabbi Alex's rabbi growing up <laughs> in Riverdale, um, Rabbi Katz. Again, I'm not positive, but in my memory, if my memory serves me correctly, when Jen and I were uh, living there together, he thought of this idea, what if you had instead of Hamelech, you had Hamalka at the top of every column? So, you know, we've just sort of had it in the back of our minds, like all these years, oh yeah, the Hamalka Megillah, some one day we're going to make the Hamalka Megillah. So this year, um, Jen, my, my teacher, um, she made a Hamalka Megillah. Her Hamalka Megillah is a pure Hamalka Megillah, meaning like the Hamalka is at the top of every column, except for the columns I can't, um, and it's very tall, it's 42 lines long, and the, width, the columns have different widths. And the one that I did um, with the assistance of another esteemed colleague of mine, uh, Rachel Jackson, is a Hamalka Megillah, but it's sort of more broad. So it, at the top of each column, it's all words that are connected to women. So it has the, the Hamalka, the queen, Nashim, women, um, Shaveh, equal, um, uh, Vinafohu, and everything was tur turned around, um, Vashti, Esther. So that's that was that's my uh, Megillah this year. Yeah, it's very it's very like Torah nerdy if you're into like that kind of thing. Just the right amount of Torah. Kind of Torah nerdy. Okay. <laughs> um, we're gonna take questions from Robert and Anna, and then we're gonna head downstairs for dinner. So when you write <clears throat> Torah or Megillah, do you have another Torah so you can? make sure that every word and letter is correct? Yes. So I'll go into this more if you're, I don't know if, who will be here on Sunday, but I'll go, I'll go into this on Sunday. But yes, nothing's permitted to be written from memory. You have to be copying from an extant text. 
Um, it, a mezuzah you can write from memory because it's assumed that you know it like quite well, but um, but not a Megillah, not not a certainly not a Torah, <laughs> even not even a not even a section from the Torah, even if you think you know it by heart. Yeah. Hi, Julie. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say it's absolute pleasure to listen to your story. It's Thank really you. fascinating. I learned so much today. And it just brought back to me a memory of the book that we read in a book club many years ago, The Weight of the Ink. And this is a woman, what, 16th century, 17th, I forgot which one, who was scribe for the blind rabbi, yeah. who was writing letters to Spinoza, and he didn't know it was a woman. Yes. You know, so that was so many years ago. It just brought back to my memory. I don't know why, but it's fascinating story. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that. And and about that book. So yeah, the weight of ink, Rachel Kaddish. Um, it's a novel, but it, you know, there, so I didn't. I wasn't super clear about this. There have been in over the course of history, women um, scribes, just not anyone that wrote a kosher Torah scroll. So Meg Megillot, for sure, um, maybe even the text of the Torah, but not to be used as like, as part of the ritual um, reading. So that's a dis that's the distinction. But yeah, that's a that's a great book. It's it's funny. I'm I'm actually I actually just started. Has anyone read the People of the Book about the Sarajevo Agata? So I just started reading that. That's also really interesting. I mean, I know it's a novel, but it's still you know it has it does have some historical information in it. So that's also really um, interesting. So yeah, thanks. So let's give Julie one more round of applause. Thank you. That was. Really fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story with us in such a great way to prime the pump for the whole weekend. So if you have more questions, there will be plenty more opportunities. If you have friends or family who are not able to make it tonight but are excited for tomorrow or Sunday, that's all on YouTube so they can catch up and hear Julie's story before they hear her speak again. Um, for now, we are going to head downstairs at the back of the social, we'll, we'll gather at the back of the social hall um, on the kitchen side for candle lighting, kiddish, and mozi, and then we'll break into the